Church, say amen. amen. First Timothy chapter 4. I know you enjoyed the good singing. All of this emphasis on the cross and the grace of God feeds my soul. <clears throat> if you didn't get anything out of that, it's because you didn't bring anything to get it in. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Our verse for consideration this evening is verse number 13, where Paul said to Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And I know he was referring to his own plans to come to Timothy, but I can't help but think about the Lord's coming and our responsibility to give attendance. Uh, this means to pay attention, to pay attention. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. I know that doesn't sound like much, but it's more than you can handle. <laughs> to pay attention. And we're to pay attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. It's like the threefold responsibility to a Christian worker, isn't it? Pay attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Please pray for me. Heavenly Father, thank you, sir, for the wonderful privilege to be here. Thank you for Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, for Pastor Hammett, all the staff. Thank you, Lord, for the good, soul-stirring music tonight. I feel that I could leave now and say it, it's truly been a blessing to be in the house of God. And thank you for these brave souls that would come out on this cool, wet evening, come to the house of God, to have their hearts warmed and their souls fed. May they not leave disappointed. Thank you for cleansing my heart uh, in prayer and by your grace. And I pray now for, for the endowment of power. Please come upon me and give me the wisdom I need to expound upon this verse and then give the people a heart and an appetite for it. And uh, may I preach with power and clarity and, and may they receive the engrafted word with meekness and grow thereby. I pray earnestly for those who are unsaved in our midst. And may the Holy Spirit of God tug at their heart and give them a deep hunger and a deep thirst for peace, for thy peace. Have mercy upon us all, and may saints rejoice and sinners repent and believe the gospel and be forever saved. Bless the other churches around the country of like faith and order and meet with them likewise, and may it be a great day, a great night, and may Jesus receive much honor and glory. In his name we pray, amen. All right. I'm a little bit afraid of that microphone. I'm afraid I'll get it in my mouth. But uh, my glasses are not zeroed in just right, and I have to kind of lean over. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. This rotten world is a mess. My flesh still loves it. It's music and it's money and it's morals and it's movies and it's mess. I must do something about my life to keep it from getting out of control. Peter exhorted those listeners in Acts chapter 2 to save themselves. He was not referring to hell or eternal damnation, but he said, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. The Greek there, untoward, amazingly, is the uh, medical term scolios, scoliosis. Uh, many 
especially young people, suffer to some degree from scoliosis of the spine. Oftentimes a tall, especially a tall, thin teenager will have a curvature of the spine. The doctors will say it's scoliosis. The Greek word means crooked, deteriorating, perverted. And that's the word the Holy Spirit gave the preacher in Acts chapter 2, if you're taking notes, I think it's verse 40. He said, save yourselves from this crooked, deteriorating, perverted generation. And of course, no one can save themselves from hell, but that certainly is a wake-up call for moms and dads and those in places of authority, our pastor and department heads and school and and Christian school, uh, some things in Christendom only Christ can do. But there's some things He expects you and I to do. Amen. Some things He expects us to do. And, and that's serious because a lot of times we'd rather sing Amazing Grace and, and enjoy singing Jesus paid it all. But then there's some things that you can do. You can. By the grace of God, there's some things you and I can do. And He told us to save ourselves from this crooked mess. And so, amen. And so that's a very serious challenge uh, when we get right down to it. He tells us to set our affection. In Colossians, maybe chapter 3, He said, If ye then be risen with Christ, he said, set your affection on things above. Amen. So what does that mean? Not on the things of the earth, not on the things of the world. And so your affections, evidently, that is according to evidence, are under your control. And God who saves us has power to do any and everything. But He's not going to run you down and twist your dumb idols out of your hands. If you want to smoke cigarettes, you can smoke them and die of a cancer. If you want to drive 100 mile an hour in a 55 zone, go ahead. You get squashed like a bug. And God won't stop you. He can. He can. But you're not a puppet nor a robot before salvation nor after. He appeals to us to come to Him and then after we're saved to yield to Him. But He's not in the business of twisting our idols out of our hands. Ain't that good? And that responsibility falls right back upon us. He has saved us from sin, from hell, for heaven and forever. Amen. Amen. But then He expects us to save ourselves from this mess. It's God's will for us to be ultra-separatist in our lifestyle, to come out from among them, to come out from the world. We are in the world but we're not to live of the world. It's not the water around the boat that sinks it, but the water that gets in it. And so there's some things that God does, and it's His prerogative, and no one else can. But then there's some things that I must do for myself, because I, I'm still in this sorry flesh, and I, and I like a lot of the things. My flesh a lot of the things out there. I mean, I, you know, I used to jump up on the bar stool and dance and pick guitar for drinks, and that's that old lifestyle. And, but see, my flesh didn't get much help when I got saved. It caused the Civil War to break out inside of me. One of the black preachers down home, he said, I've got a do-good spirit and a do-bad spirit. The Indian down in Cherokee told the missionary, he said, I've got the victory. He said, I've got that white dog and that black dog tied up in my heart, and they fight all the time. The missionary said, don't sound like much victory to me. Yeah. He said, they fight day and night. But he said, white dog always win. And the missionary said, well, if they fight all the time, why does the white dog always win? He said, it's the only one I'll feed. <laughs> we need to think about that. 
You don't have to read Playboy to feed the white dog. Just ride down the road and read the posters on the interstate. And that old black dog will pick him up a nibble here and there. And you can screw the old man down in a coffin and put Elmer's glue on the edge and twin fast screws in the top, but every once in a while he'll still pull a resurrection. <laughs> we just might as well admit it, we're rotten. We want faster horses, newer cars, prettier women, and more money, say amen. amen. Four wheelers, whether it be in Browning shotguns and rifles, free vacations. What can I do to keep myself from just getting absolutely, recklessly out of control. My flesh is as bad as it ever was. The idea, and I'm quite an idealist, is for the spirit man to mature enough to tell the flesh man what to do or where to get off. If not, then the flesh man's going to be telling the spirit man what to do. Stay in the bed on Sunday morning. Take somebody else's companion out and spend your time. Don't you think for a minute your flesh doesn't have the capability of goofing up? You can do almost anything you did when you was lost and do it worse. And if you're out of control or if you're, as the songwriter said, uh, prone to wonder. I don't remember his name. Maybe the singer remembers. Come thy fount of every blessing. They said that precious man who wrote that song had been out of the Lord's will for four or five years and was going west on a train. And as he was traveling west on the train, a mother with three or four little fretting children were sitting right in front, and she had a, you know, a, a diaper baby and then a toddler, and then you know how it is. And it's, it's precious after a while, but when they're that age, it's a mess. And she, she was trying her best... <laughs> trying, you know, comfort this one, and the other one was holding on to sucking its thumb, and the other one had a little old security blanket, and so she was trying to hold and rock, and that old train going whackity, 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 and holding that little baby, and so she, she started singing, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, and this man began to just bawl out loud right behind her. She said, I, I knew my singing was bad, didn't know it was that bad. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, madam. He said, you see, I wrote that song when I walked with God and felt his power. He said, now I've wandered far, far away. Don't you ever underestimate the depravity of a human soul. So we need something. We, you say, oh, I have Jesus. I have the Holy Ghost. So do I. Uh, we still like that freebie stuff, don't we? But this Word of God tonight is what I want to talk about, one of the things, and how we need this Word of God, daily basis, hourly basis, hide it in our heart. This King James Bible is powerful stuff. And I hit that last night, and I thought it, you know, it would leave me, but it just got worse, so I'm going to have to talk about it a little bit. Preacher, you, you know what I mean. I thought if I could just tap it a little and go on. But... But be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, thank God for the place of prayer and, and, and fellowship and being in the right church. But he said, by the renewing of your mind. This Word of God has the capability of renewing your mind. Be not conformed to this world. It means be not pressed into the world's form or the world's mold. Now, my grandma stayed with us some, and they loved to make that homemade butter. We had Jersey cow and a Guernsey cow, and that, those Guernsey, Guernseys and Jerseys, why, when you milk them, the cream will settle a third of the way down on the jar. It's so rich, and they make that butter. Now, Mama would make her butter, and we put it in the spring house, but Grandma's butter was there too. But see, they had two different butter molds. Now, butter molds a little wooden cup like this with a little paddle in it, and you press the butter, the soft, moist butter down into it, and whatever drawing or brand is inside this mold will transfer itself to the butter. That's how, I mean, when I went down to the spring house, some company would come and say, we want a half a pound of Ma's butter. 
Well, that's Aunt Emma. That's my grandma. And so I had to go down there, and they'd wrap it up in that wax paper. You say, how could you tell the difference? Well, you see, my mama's butter had a wheat head on it. But grandma must have been a part of the Eastern Star. She had a Mason Star on her. You see, inside that butter mold, grandma's butter mold had a star. Mama's had a wheat head. And you could tell whose butter uh, was whose by uh, the insignia or the markings or the tattoo on, on the butter. Be not pressed into the world's butter mold. You see, you can't live in Moab all week and come around Bethlehem and folks not be able to take. And the mark of the world, I mean, it puts its insignia on you and wise people can see it. Amen. And so God said, be not conformed. That means pressed into the world's butter mold. I added the word butter. Pressed into the world's mold. Be not conformed to this world. Then we have a conjunction. But, so we are to be conformed, but not to the world. He said, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, I can remember jokes. I'm talking about dirty jokes. And I don't just mean the white horse fell in the mud hole either. That my uncles told me before I started in the school, before I went in the first grade, I can remember some of those old jokes my drunken uncles used to tell. Now, I haven't rehearsed them. And as far as I know, in 35 years, I haven't told them, but I can still remember them vividly. Now, if I'm going to remember the sixth chapter of Romans, I'd sit down and go over it and over it and over it and over it because, see, my flesh is against that. But it gets along good with them white horse felling them, et cetera, and et cetera, jokes. And so I have to do something. I have to have an antidote. I have to do something to help myself. And so he said, until I come, pay attention. Now, that's what I'm preaching on. Give attendance. That's what those words mean. It means pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, first of all, to reading. Now, pay attention means let it grab you. It means let it hold your mind. It's not just a fleeting thought. It's not just something that goes in one ear and out the other like your latest history lesson in school, but it's something that gets your attention. It's something that causes your mouth to drop open. It's something that causes you, your brain to dilate. You're just, it just grabs you. And that's what it means here when he says pay attention or give attendance. It means to let it grab you. It means to hold the mind, to regard, to pay attention, to be cautious, and to apply yourself to reading to reading. This man didn't have a library. So you know the references to the reading of the Word of God. Reading, reading, verb tense. It's uh, something like angonosis. It's one of those gnosis words. You Greek students know that those knowledge words, gnosis, 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 angonosis. And it has to do with reading, but it literally means read it again. Really, it means to know it. To know it again, and 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 to know it again. You can read your Old Testament in 52 hours and 20 minutes, the New Testament in 18 hours and 20 minutes, the entire Bible in 70 hours and 40 minutes, that is average pulpit speed. Now you can read faster than that when you read silently and don't have to pronounce the words or but I'm talking about the average, well, Alexander Scorby or some of these readers, they read average pulpit speed. 52 hours or 18 hours in the New Testament, 70 hours and 40 minutes, you can read 10 hours a day and read your Bible through in a week. But I don't advise that. But I mean, it can be done. I have some friends that have done it. It can be done. Uh, uh, but he's saying, know it again and know it again and know it again. And that means to just be constantly and consistently reading the Word of God. 1189 chapters, 733,000 words. And you need to know that this is not just here to carry around till the cover wears out, but it's here for us to, to, to ingest, digest, receive, take into our hearts and lives this blessed Word of God and continually cleanse and renew our mind. There's a deep detergent, there's a cleaning element to the Word of God. 
Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Watch by taking heed according to thy word. He said, now you're clean through the word that I have, John 17, 17, sanctify yourselves through that truth. My word is truth. And this would, now thank God we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Say amen. amen. But then we need to continually be cleansed. When I know when you see that TH in the English, it's keep on cleansing, and I rejoice in that. He keeps on cleansing us. He keeps us, he saves us, and he keeps us saved. But then he's given us this word of God. You got washed in the blood of the Lamb when you came to Christ, but you need to take a bath in this King James Bible every day. Amen. If you're going to prevent, prevent the spiritual B.O. <laughs> and so we have this word of God that can be read in, 50, in, in, in 70 hours and 40 minutes. This is brain influence. This is here to control our life. This is here to give us the right kind of reflexive action. You know, the doctor uh, pops you on the knee and your leg, you have reflexes. And, and if a bird flies against your windshield, your hand will fly up and you'll grab the baby without even thinking. And we need some emotional and spiritually emotional reactions to the things that the devil tosses our way. And unless this Word of God's alive in us, we'll have the wrong kind of reaction. You'll be smacking somebody in the mouth. But understand, when you read this Word of God, your mindset is different. Amen. Amen. You're, you're, you're cocked and you're ready, but it's in a, in a different way. And it doesn't matter what the world throws at you tomorrow at work. If you're full of this Word of God, if you'll get up in the morning and pray and read that Bible, you can take it. But if, but if you don't get up and pray and read that Bible, you'll go into the work world tomorrow and it'll be like stepping into a ring with with Iron Mike Tyson with no guard and no jab and, and he'll bite your ear off. <laughs> Wake up, boys. I have a good, good friend in Florida. Well, he's pastoring in Georgia now, and he has tremendous ears. And he's always joking about it, so I feel free to... I mean, they're almost big as my hand. And he's... He's a wonderful preacher. He said, I've been trying to get my deacons to get me a fight with Mike Tyson. He said, I'm the only man in America that can last him a full round. <laughs> he said, I'm the only man in America that's got enough ears to last him a full, a full round. But we need to have our mind, just like God in His grace, continually cleanses our soul, keeps on cleansing us. Amen. We need something to clean up our mind and clean up our heads. It's awful. Why, some of you have had thoughts since this service started. You ought to be locked up, you nasty thing. Since this service started. And we need to realize that and fill our hearts and minds with this cleansing power of the Word of God. We need to do something for ourselves. There's some things in Christianity we can't do, but honey, there's some things we can do, amen, if we're going to save ourselves and save our children from this crooked, perverted, deteriorating world and time in which we live with all of the onslaught of sodomy and bigotry and all of these schisms and isms and the Muslims wanting to take over the world. We need the cleansing of the Word of God. We need to fortify ourselves with this truth. Amen. Somebody amen. say amen. And so that's my challenge tonight. I... Since I'm a doctor, can I just write you a prescription? If, if, you're, if you're having a little problem there where you work, maybe with, with honesty, then, then just add one chapter to your reading. If you're reading two chapters a day, then start reading three chapters. And if you'll start reading three chapters, I'll guarantee you that you'll get along better in that situation. If you don't, come back and see me next week, and I'll talk to you some more about it. But now, if you're having a, tro a problem with lust down there where you work, you need to add two chapters. If you're reading two, then you need to start reading four because, you know, that's, and you need to, you need to add to that reading. Listen, it doesn't make any difference. What, if there's someone down there that just ticks you off and you just can't hardly, and the personalities just clash every time you're around, you need to add to your Bible reading. You say, well, 
What I need is more patience. Add to your Bible reading. You say, what I need is more prayer. Add to your Bible reading. You see, there's some things you can't do. But, honey, there's something you can do. You need to increase your Bible reading. If you'll, if you'll consume more of this Word of God, I promise you it'll strengthen you and it'll help you. It doesn't make any difference. What the problem is, it's good for what ails you. Amen. 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 89 chapter 733,000 words. But the King James Bible has only 6,000 different words. The King James Bible is written on about an 8th grade level. Now, you ought to praise God for that. You ought to praise God for William Tyndale. You ought to praise God for the translators that translate our Bible. You ought to praise God for your King James Bible. Amen. It's not just written for the elite and for the school and, and for the degree. It's written for all of God's people. Amen. All English-speaking people are to read the King James Bible. Amen. Only 6,000, only 6,000 uh, words in the, in the whole Bible, different words. The word and, A-N-D, appears 46,000 times. And I can read it every time. I can spell it most of the time. <laughs> 46,000 times. Why, well, you've already memorized a whole lot of the Bible when you just memorize the ands. <laughs> And so it's a beautiful thing when you see how that God and His marvelous, if somebody says, can you quote the whole Bible? You say, 46,000 words of it I can. <laughs> yes, sir, amen. It's a wonderful thing. And you ought to thank God for that. You ought to thank God that He's given us a Bible and it's, it's grammar and, and the sentence structure and the paragraph divisions and the sentence structure and the words that He used. Do you realize the average word in the King James Bible has five letters? Five letters. That's the average size. Well, now there are some pretty big words in there too, but, only, but the average word has five letters. And, and how many one-syllable words are in the King James Bible? You take great passages like that Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That passage has 33 words, and I counted them. 31 of them are one-syllable words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man. One-syllable words, and I can read all of them. One-syllable words. Out of 33 words, 31 of them are one-syllable words. The model prayer that some call the Lord's Prayer has 66 words, and 50 of them are one-syllable words. The 23rd Psalm, 118 words, and 93, I counted them, 93 of the words out of the 118 are one-syllable words. God wants me to understand. You can tell by now I'm a redneck and a ridge runner. God wants me to understand His Word. And I can tell a lot of y'all rednecks and ridge runners. And God wants you to understand His Word. Amen. Amen. I'm glad it's not something we have to go run into the priest or run into the teacher, yeah, teacher. Run. Right. And I'm glad you don't have to come to the pastor every day and say, what's this say? What's this say? And there are times when you do need uh, someone who studied the languages and someone who can, can conjugate a verb to tell you something about it. But I tell you, for the most part, thank God, we can read our Bibles for ourselves. My good old mountain daddy, my old mountain daddy said, it's not them verses I don't understand that keep me praying. It's them verses I do understand that keep Amen. me praying. Amen. You say, well, what can you say with a five-letter word? Well, let me give you a few five-letter words, and you repeat them back to me. That'll keep you awake, okay? Little old puny five-letter words. Grace. Grace. Faith. Faith. Mercy. Mercy. Power. Power. I mean, these are, are the words. They're not just words. I mean, this Bible is held together with those little old words like, Grace and, Grace and faith. Grace. I mean, these little, these little words, these are the cardinal doctrines of the blessed book of God. These, these are the words that make the difference in heaven and in hell. What about this one? Saved. Saved. Glory. Glory. You didn't say it right. Glory. Glory. Yes, sir. Peace. Peace. Blood. Blood. The cross. These are just a little old puny fight. But listen, God has chosen, God has chosen to set forth His truth 
to the English-speaking people whom I believe he's holding responsible to send missionaries to the entire world. Amen. And you better listen to what I'm saying tonight. God is, but he's, he's set it forth in such simplicity and little little five-letter, one-syllable words. Thank God he wants us to understand blood and cross and, and, and light and trust and truth Amen. and bread. Let me, let me give you a five-letter word. You say it back to me. Jesus. <laughs> That's no way to say it. You didn't say it right. Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. We have these little puny five-letter words, but they are the words and the main words and the words that mean so much to us. Uh, George Mueller said, the vigor of our spiritual life, Mueller, he said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Word of God in our life and in our thoughts. The vigor, that's good. You're under conviction just like I am. The vigor of my spiritual life, the vigor, what's your name, Hoss? Orlando. What? Orlando. Orlando. <laughs> Orlando. Orlando, the vi I don't know a thing about you, but the vigor, the zeal, the energy, the temperament, the power, the excitement, the vigor of your spiritual life will be in exact proportion as to the place the Word of God has in your life. Listen, some things we can't do, some things we can do. He said, well, I wish uh, the Lord had touched me so I could really get on fire. I wish the Lord would help me so I could be a real soul winner. Uh, I, I wish the Lord, I wish. we say we don't believe in Calvinism, yet we act like Calvinists. Listen, the Word of God is what you need. You read that Word of God. And if you're saved, it'll fire you up, buddy. If you read that Word of God, why don't you sit down tomorrow, sit down tonight? Why don't you give up an hour of sleep and tuck in about 10 chapters out of this Holy Ghost-inspired King James Bible? This Word of God's alive. You can't take it in your life and it not change your life. John said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, he said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Honey, when you receive the word of God, you're receiving him. Amen. Now, when you get saved, John chapter 1, verse, when you get saved, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the exousia. It's not dunamis there, it's authority. The exousia, he gave him the authority, the God-given right, and it's translated correctly, the power to become the sons of God. He gave you the power, the God-given right, the God-given authority when you received him, but then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> you see, when you receive him, you receive his word. You receive his sayings. You see, when you reject the Word of God, honey, you reject Him. When you receive the Word of God, you receive Him. When you receive Him, you receive His truth. They're inseparable. And so when you receive Christ, you receive what Christ said, and not just the red letter edition either. Amen. amen. And so when you get saved, you receive Him. Say amen. amen. And then when you keep reading your Bible, you keep on receiving Him. Amen. Now, you were so excited the day you got saved and the week after you got saved. You were so Orlando was so, so excited, and we call it our first love. And we want to call everybody and tell everybody, and hey, man, we witnessed to the Pope and Hitler and the devil himself, and we can find them. We're so turned on. But you see, as you continue to read this King James Bible, you continue to re receive him, and it, it's just a carry-on of the excitement and the exciting life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Honey, we shouldn't get saved and it go off like a stick of dynamite and then kind of fizzle out along the way. You know how you light a fuse and, and it goes, A lot of us got saved and it went yeah. <laughs> But you see, we, we should never lose our first love. I'll tell you how it ought to be. It ought to be 
all along the way. I mean, it ought to get better and better. We shouldn't get saved and then cool off, honey. Praise God, if you realize he saved you from hell and you're just going to live forever, then you ought to stay excited. But the way we do that, our old flesh wants to pull us down and weight us down and pull us down and pull us down. But as we read that word of God, he keeps on strengthening. He keeps on pumping us up. Amen. Amen. Ain't we having fun? The Bible. The Bible contains the condition of man. The only way of salvation, the doom of sinners, happiness for believers, its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to sustain you, and to comfort you and to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, and the soldier's sword. I'm about to shout. And it is the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven is open, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Amen. Amen. I believe I've spit inside my own glasses. <laughs> you know, I used to, I didn't have that problem. I could preach right in your face and you wouldn't need windshield wipers, but what's happened? I've had, they tell me I've had two strokes, one on each side, at least I'm balanced, amen. But, uh, and it's affecting my memory a little bit, and then it causes me to spit, so all y'all will be Methodists before I get done. <coughs> you love the Word of God, say amen. amen. Well, I'm glad you love the Word of God, but now, 98% of all professing Christians have never read their Bible through one time. 98% of professing Christendom have never read. And some of you have read your Bible every day for 30 years. But, you know, you, you, know, you start reading uh, the book of James and you say, Ouch, I better go back and read Psalms again. And you never get through that Word of God. And you let the devil cheat you even in your daily Bible reading. How are you going to have any victory? Honey, take it just like God gives it to you. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the church epistles and the pastoral epistles and the Jewish epistles and the Old Testament and the New Testament. Thank God John is a good old boy, but you can't spend all your life reading the Gospel of John. Read the Bible. Take it. I mean, it's got the vitamins and the protein and the sugars and the starches and the fats and everything that you need to give you a good, well-balanced diet. Your pastor, does, your pastor doesn't preach the same thing all the time. How many of you might get up and preach some juicy verse out of the book of Hebrews and take you back to Leviticus and, and bless you and then come right back the next day and and preach something on the other end of history, on the other end of the, of the Bible, and God deals with his heart and gives you a well-balanced diet. There are times when you need something real rich like horse and mule feed, and then there are times when you need a bell of hay. But you see, when you read your Bible, it, it's all in the book. All of it's there. Right there in the blessed Word of God, it's there. And so you shouldn't just skip around and find something that's Palatable and something that tastes good. And something. Just read the Word of God. It'll, it'll do you good and help you too. Amen. Amen. But 98%, I wonder tonight, and I wouldn't do this because you can tell I'm a very sweet man. <laughs> but I wonder how many tonight, if I were to ask you, how many of you know that you've read the entire Bible? If I were to ask you to lift your hand. I wonder if you'd be embarrassed. I wonder maybe if some of your children raised their hands and parents didn't. The only thing I see wrong with the Christian school movement is some of the children are more spiritually mature than their mom and their daddy. That went over like a lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> Do you realize that two-thirds of the Bible, or two-thirds of the books of the Bible, you know there's 66 books, so two-thirds of the books would be 44, 44 of the books of the Bible can be read in 30 minutes or less. Dr. Harry Ironside, at age 12, had read his Bible through 10 times. 
Mueller, he amazes me. But see, he's known as a man of prayer. And he prayed for those orphans and for those orphanages and how that God just supplied the need through prayer. I mean, we, we read about that and we praise God for the way he blessed Mueller. And most of us in our ignorance say, oh, the Lord sure gave him an inside line when it comes to prayer. Or we say, boy, God really gave him a whole lot of faith. Well, listen, that wouldn't be right. If God gave it to him, he'll give it to me. You see, God gives to every man a measure of faith as far as his salvation is concerned. God gives everyone enough faith to be saved. But after that, you'll never convince me that God will just give Pastor Hammett more faith than he'll give me or you. You never, and you can tell me that, you don't get me to believe. I don't believe. I'm too hard headed to believe. <laughs> the Bible said, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's what the Bible said. Now, if you wanted to hear a lie, you could go to the Methodist church. They'll tell you a lie. But you can't hear it. I'm going to tell you the truth. After you got saved, the amount of faith you have is up to you. You lay around lazy and read everything in the world, novels and them stories and all that stuff make you liver quiver and all that stuff, and don't read the Word of God, and then when some tragedy breaks out in your life, you're deficient in faith. I know what I said. But if you read that Word of God, then you'll have the sufficient faith that you need. I've always admired Mueller and his prayer life in and that's what the emphasis of the writer when you read about Mueller is how he believed God and he prayed and he prayed and they gathered one morning to eat breakfast. All the children gathered. You've heard the story. They all gathered around the table and they're ready to say the blessing. But there's not a bite of food in the house. Little girl said, preacher said, all right, let's pray. Little girl said, preacher, there ain't no food here. He said, well, honey, let's just pray. He said, the Lord always has provided. And let's just thank him. She said, thank him for what? There's no food here. Little girl was a realist. She wasn't a pessimist nor an optimist. She was just a realist. Amen. <laughs> I had a little girl in my school who said, I want to be an optimist. <laughs> but you see, she didn't see any toast and she didn't see any milk and she, she was thankful, but she wanted, she was used to saying, Thank you, Lord, when she could peep out of the corner of her eye and see them fresh homemade biscuits. He said, Honey, let's just pray. So they all bowed their head like that, and he began to pray and said, Our father, someone knock at the door. And the door wasn't latched, and it came open. And the fellow said, Oh, excuse me, preacher, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He said, Can I help you? He said, Well, he said, I, I, he said, I just had a truck wreck out here. The wagon turned over, and he said, I got eggs and flour, and I've got milk, and I've got um, pastries and sweet things, and it's going to perish out there. He said, Is there any way, any, any way y'all could use any of that? He said, <clears throat> Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps we could use some of that stuff. I mean, God, again and again, those children in those homes, honey, they just live from hand to mouth, from God's hand to their mouth. Church, say amen. You say, oh, the Lord really gave him a great gift in prayer. He really had a main line. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Oh, Mueller really had, he was really plugged in. Oh, no, 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 no. Mueller read his Bible through every three months for 69 years. I read a biography before, earlier, and it said 58 years, and then later another one came out, and, and he continued till his last, as long as he could see. He read his, are you listening to me now? Oh, if I just had more faith, it's your own fault. Well, I need to go get someone to pray for me, somebody that's a real man of faith. Mueller read his Bible through every three months for 69 years. Some things only Christ can do. There's some things you can do. There's some things I can do. If you want to have an unwavering faith, if you want to have that faith that God honors, if you want to see miracles in your life and the lives of your children, if listen, some of your loved ones that are gone and some of your family that's shipped out and they're shipwrecked, some of the people that we witnessed to and prayed for, some of the tragedies that trail us like a shadow everywhere we go, some of that perhaps would not have happened if we'd just spent time reading our Bible so we could pray with faith. 
Some of your prayers would have been answered. Some of my prayers would have been answered. Would have had more, more faith to believe God if we just would have availed ourselves to the reading of the Word of God. God gave us this Word to read it and know it again and know it again and know it. Anginosis. So that it built, Romans 10, 17, now faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And not just reading, but hearing. Not just reading, but hearing. Amen. Don't ever miss a sermon. Don't ever miss a Sunday school lesson. You see, when you miss a Sunday school lesson, you are missing hearing the Word of God. When you miss hearing your pastor preach, you're missing hearing hearing the Word of God. If you'd like to take full advantage and, and kick all of your senses in gear, then get you a good Bible reader on tape and listen as you drive to work. Listen as you drive home. Listen when you're going down the road. And then a lot of times you can read it and listen at the same time. And then you hear it and you see it and it just kicks everything open and you can receive that Word of God. You see, it just takes ten and a half I ought to say 12 and a half, 10 to 15 minutes a day to read your Bible through every year. Between 10 and 12 minutes. Three and a third chapters, maybe three and a half chapters. And I know some chapters are three, four times longer than the other chapters, but it balances out that way. In other words, if you, if you drive 20 minutes to work, then, then, you can, then you can listen going and coming and go through your Bible two times in a year without even opening it up. Just listen to those tapes. Listen to those tapes. Now, if you'd rather listen to that old country music, then let the world go to hell. Right. But if we'll take that time, and you'd be surprised how much better driver you'll be, and how much more patience you'll have in the traffic, when you're reading that blessed Word of God, when you listen to that Word of God, you pull into the gas pump, just turn her up, roll the window down, get out, pump that gas. And listen, that, that other crowd can sit out there and go, boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Why can't we roll our, why can't we roll our windows down and let them hear a real blast? Somebody amen. say amen. 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 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. There's your dunamis. Power, it means dynamite. The power, the power of the gospel. There's enough power in the gospel to blow the devil right out of you. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the dynamite, the dunamio, the dunam, the power of God unto, little word eos means resulting in, the power of God resulting in salvation, everyone to believe the Jew first and also the Greek. And I believe that. I believe this gospel is gospel dynamite. And I believe it has the power to transform lives. I believe everyone that will believe this gospel, everyone that will receive Christ, I don't care if he's as low down as a hound dog with a mange and fleas. I still believe you can be saved because of this power in God's grace. Hey, we're having a time. George Mueller read it through every three months. So, preacher, don't say that again. We think about his faith in his prayer life, and then we think about how puny, how puny our little our prayer life is, and how that we have to go to others to help us and to, and to pray for us. But you see, the, the reason God answered Grandma's prayers is because. Grandma read her Bible. The reason God answers Pastor Hammett's prayers is because he spent time reading his Bible. Listen, friend, there is a direct relationship between the amount. I'm talking about the word that you receive and how much faith that you have. Don't whine to God for not, oh, Lord, if you just increase my faith. You better watch out. I mean, he might stretch your muscle and let you, let you use what faith you have. But the easiest way is just get this King James Bible. Amen. Let me read nine chapters, seven hundred thirty-three thousand words, three million five hundred sixty-six thousand letters. Read this King James Bible, and it is a faith builder. Amen. Some things we can do for a Oh, Doctor Son Ravenhill read his Bible through forty times in six months. You can read it in four and a half days. You won't, you won't sleep much if you read it in four and a half days. I had some friends in Georgia one summer that read their Bible through every week for 10 weeks. And, uh, but it takes 70 hours. I mean, you can't go fishing to the yard sales and the flea markets, the Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. I mean, you just fast and pray. Do you good to go somewhere to a retreat. I mean, just you, not some 
big thing with barbecue chicken and not, but just, you know, or go on one of these cruises with uh, the Inspiration Quartets or something like that. But I'm talking about just go to some secluded place that might be your basement, but then off maybe to some cabin in the woods somewhere and just take you some good distilled water and if you can fast, and some folks can't do that, and just read that Bible. And when that old flesh says, feed me, feed me, you say, well, hush, I'm going to read me about 50 more chapters before I feed. And just feed our souls on that blessed word of God. And you might come home and pray and one of your teenagers get saved. You might pray and see some person that you prayed for for years come to Christ. You might see God begin to raise up someone who's infirmed. There's no telling what he might do. There might be a warehouse in heaven full of stuff with your name on it. But we just won't pay the price. Okay. We read a story about Debbie Hill. Ralph Sexton Sr.'s wife told me about Debbie Hill. She was a senior in high school now. And this was during the academic year. She was carrying the load, all right? She was doing her work and a, a great day a straight-A student, and she read her Bible through 20 times that year while she was carrying that, carrying that load. You want me to go on to something else, huh? <laughs> I'm talking about the King James Bible. I'm not talking about some uh, West Cotton Horse junk. I'm not talking about some uh, West Cotton Horse junk. I'm not talking about some manuscript that's been butchered 1,500 times, but I'm talking about this immutable, divinely inspired King James Bible. Just like God himself, it's perfect. It's the Word of God, and God has given us this King James Bible. Read this King James Bible. It's good for whatever ails you. Amen. 66 books bound up in one book, 40 Holy Ghost inspired writers over a period of 1,600 years, and some of them were separated by 1,500 miles, yet there's perfect unity and harmony between its parts. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Encourage the old man now. Amen. amen. Give me a Baptist nod. Amen. Okay. It's indestructible, Matthew 24, 35. It's incorruptible, 1 Peter 1, 23. It's indispensable, Matthew 4, 4. It's infallible, Matthew 5, 18. Amen. It's inexact. Y'all still here? Say amen. amen. You love your mother? Say amen. amen. It's inexhaustible, Psalm 92, 5. It's planned by the Father, accomplished by the Son, revealed by the Spirit. So that means God thought it. Christ wrote it. Holy Ghost brought it. Satan fought it. Praise God, I've got it. Amen. I've got, I've got me a Bible. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm going to have to quit or go take another pill. Amen. It's point number two. Amen. He said, till I come, Give attendance. Now that literally means, pay attention, means let it grab you. Let it hold your mind. Let your thought process stop running away and just come to a screeching halt. That's what it means. Till I come, pay attention to reading. And then in second place, to exhortation, paralysis. This word means to encourage one another and to hold one another up. And we need to understand that this is a ministry that we all had better get in on. Some, some men are called and divinely anointed to preach. And others, God has given the talent to teach and to sing. And there's a place for them in the local church activity. But, excuse me, but every person can have this ministry of prayer and encouraging others. And God's people ought to be professionals at it. You ought to be able to spot someone that's down. And a lot of times we get down physically, emotionally, domestically, financially. And you see, we're all in this thing together. Fellowship is two fellers in the same ship. <laughs> it does. It means having things in common. We're, we're so close. We're one body. And we have one head. Amen. He said, ye are the body of Christ. The members in particular, the member of the Greek word is melos, it means body parts. So you're not the church, but you're a member of the body. You're a hand or a finger or a toe or an ear. 
Have you looked at your nose lately? <laughs> and you see, we make up this body. Now, Christ is the head of this body. Now, you think about that now. Praise God, you might be a hand. But what's that worth without a wrist or a forearm or a shoulder? And you might be a, a foot. I mean, the strength of a man's in his legs. But then what about maybe that person that led you to Christ is closer to the head than you are. And you see, no man liveth to himself, nor dieth in himself, and we need one another. And that central nervous system's up here somewhere in our cranium or in our cerebellum or our cortex hemispheres, and that, that, that central nervous system's up here, and it sends out them signals and tells me to click my heels. <laughs> but you see, it takes some coordination. And there's no way that the limbs will coordinate unless they're all getting the signal from the same place. So I can brush my teeth. And the hands minister to the body and look after the body. And so you, you can wash your feet and, and I can comb all this hair and all these things because I have this signal. And it's because that signal comes out, you see, and it tells everything is coordinated. You know, I'm, the elbow moves and the mouth opens. And that's all coming... And you see the church, Christ is the head of the church. But see, we've got all messed up. We go somewhere and join because it's close to college. We go somewhere because I got a job down there and so I joined that church. We go over here because they have a good singing or a real nice pastor. We go, and what we've done, we've turned the local body into a centipede with 10,000 legs and no arms. You need to know the Holy Spirit put you here. You need to know Jesus is your head. And then there'll be a place for you, and there'll be something for you to do except warm a pew. Some of you warm them about 18 inches of a pew, or 24. <laughs> and you think just coming here and just sitting here and being part, we're glad you're here. Amen. Amen, Pastor. I mean, every time you stay out, you're voting that we close you down. We're glad you're here, but perhaps God had something else in mind. I mean, perhaps he wants to put you in the body. And you're going to be a foot or a hand or a leg or something. And Christ is going to send that warm nerve flow into your life and cause you to cooperate with her and cause her to cooperate with him and let the church roll on. I mean, how are we going to march under the bloodstained banner of the cross without some coordination? Amen. And we need one another. And so we're supposed to pay attention to exhortation. And exhort one another, even so much the more as you see the day approaching. And we ought to have a ministry of exhortation while to look after one another, while to help one another out. You see some old boy come in here and he's so low. I mean, his, his coattails are dragging out his tracks. He's so low. Well, don't criticize the poor fellow. Go back and ask him to come and sit with your family. Maybe his wife threw him out last night. Maybe he lost his job. Maybe his mother wrote him a Dear John letter. And we need to take up the slack. Hey, there's no, hey, 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 there's no telling what might have happened to them out there in that secular world. But we come here to the haven of rest. We come here to Souls Harbor. Amen. We come here where we can tie up or drop our anchor for a little while and let somebody sing to us. Amen. Let somebody preach to us and encourage us before we go back out there in that hell hole, before we go back to that rat race. We need to come here and get some encouragement from the Word of God. We need to come here and be exhorted and reproved and rebuked. Amen. Amen. And we need to repent and get some help. And we need to encourage one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me say, y'all pretty tough. You can probably take this. Listen, we need to let the preacher do the preaching. And you need to keep your own mouth shut. Our Sunday school lessons ought to be 99% positive. Our testimony means ought to always be positive. Don't testify and take a swing at somebody or you're testifying. And there are times when the pastor wants that Sunday school teacher to deal with something, and he'll show you. But that Sunday school ought to be positive. Ours was on Sunday morning. It was positive. And, you're, and then we testify, and we teach, and we exhort, and we encourage, and we encourage. Someone may be heading down the dead-end street of a divorce. Someone may, be, may have a teenager who didn't come in last night. Someone, someone may be pregnant, and, and no one knows. I mean, I mean, your mama thinks you're a virgin, but you know you're not. 
And you don't know what folks are going through. I say you don't know what they're going through. And we'll encourage them, we'll encourage them. You say, ah, oh, them old hippies come in here, them earrings, them old ponytails on them men. I'm going to get out and wreck. You ought to shut up. Right over here is the fellow that God, you say, well, he didn't say anything about it. He'll get around to it. You see, they don't need to be shaved. They need to be saved. Amen. Amen. Who gives a flip if they're shaved? They need to be saved. And there's not one verse in the Bible against a man having a beard. Of course, there are some verses against rebelling against your pastor. If he don't want you to have one, you ought to shave. But I'm just saying some gal comes in in a miniskirt or some fella comes in don't look right and you won't get up and clean their plow. Well, right there's the one, right there. You see, there's a difference. When the anointing of God is upon that man, he can preach it and they'll receive it because the Spirit of God will take it and saturate it with love and compassion and the Spirit of God will say, that man preached to me, to me and he did it with my best interest at heart and they'll be able to receive it. But then when you say something, they'll go on down the road. Let me tell you something. Buster, they didn't have to come here anyway. They could have gone down to the Mormon mess, the Jehovah's False Witness Hall. They didn't have to come to this Baptist church. They didn't have to come here. And if they had enough respect for you, and if they believed that this was an authentic place to come, and they had enough respect for you, and perhaps they know someone that attends here, then they came here, we ought to at least encourage them. Amen. Amen. Encourage them. And then especially the people of God. We ought to look for opportunities to strengthen one another and help one another. Amen. Amen. Encourage people that are having a problem with their children. We'll encourage them. They're having a problem with their health. Encourage them. Say, I'm a praying for you. I want you to pray for you every day. And then don't lie about it. Go ahead and pray for them. We need to help one another. Amen. Amen. Listen to these scriptures. For we are members one of another, brethren. Romans 12, 5. I won't give you all these references, but listen. For we're members one of another. So oh, I'm a member of Christ. I'm, he said, we're members one of another. I mean, if you're hooked up to Jesus and I'm hooked up to Jesus, we hooked up to each other. That's the local church. You think you're the Lone Ranger, huh? Some of you are so proud and independent. If you was the Lone Ranger, you wouldn't let Tano ride with you. <laughs> Listen to these one another verses. Now, I want you to listen. For we are members one of another. So we are to exhort one another. Hebrews 3. Be kindly affection one to another. We are to prefer one another. Be of the same mind one toward another. Love ye one another. Edify one another. Admonish one another. Care one for another. Bear ye one another's burdens. Lie not one to another, brethren. Speak not evil one of another. Grudge not one against the... See the Bibles? That's what this New Testament's all about. Only four commandments have to do with our relationship to God and six commandments our relationship to one another. Grudge not one against another, brethren. Forbear one another in love. Be tenderhearted. Was that Ephesians 4.32? But be ye kind one to another. Tenderhearted, forgiven one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. How much are we, John, how much are we supposed to forgive one another? Just as much as God for Christ. Oh, that's tough. If you give an invitation right now, I'd come to the altar. He said, be tenderhearted one to another. Forgive one another. Submit one to another. Teach one another. Comfort ye one of another. Consider one another. Fellowship one with another. Confess your faults one to another. Pray ye one for another. Have compassion one to another. Use hospitality one to the other. Minister the same one to another. First Peter 4.10. Esteem others better than yourself. Exhortation. Until I come, pay attention, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Now the word doctrine simply means teaching, the teaching, the teaching. One uninformed Baptist said, well, said I love my pastor. Said he don't preach doctrine. Said he just preaches Jesus. And I said, ma'am, that's the greatest doctrine in the Bible. The teaching, the doctrine, same thing. I wouldn't give you five cents for preaching that didn't give me something I could take home with me. That's what's happened now in America. We've got to where we go see some dude preach. So, boy, he could really preach, man. He jumped that eye. He said, well, 
What did he preach on? I don't know, but boy, you let him have it. He sure did. Yeah, he jumped out and shout. Well, hallelujah. And don't have any idea what the dude said. And I have, you know, I kind of, I'm kind of emotional myself. But I, <laughs> I wouldn't give you a 10 cent a box car load for a preacher that didn't show me something, teach me something. If he's going to get with God and labor with God and pray and fast and seek the face of God, I want him to tell me something I didn't know. Amen. Now, we rejoice and rehearse and repeat a lot of things we all know. And that's just good preaching, amen. But I want somebody to teach me something, amen. The doctrine in the Bible is here for our instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, truly furnished. That's truly, not thoroughly, but truly. The Bible speaks to the husband, Ephesians 5, 25. The wife, 1 Timothy 2, 9. The teenagers, Ephesians 6. The preacher, the pastor, the deacons, Titus 1, 6 through 9, and their wives must be faithful in all things. Uh oh, I need to say this. There are a lot of wonderful, great, wonderful deacons who are disqualified from being deacons because their wives are not faithful in all things. If your wife is not faithful, you say, what does that mean? It means she's got to be faithful in all things. Amen. Amen. And if she isn't, you are disqualified to be. The preacher, the pastor, the, the church, the singer, the shouter, the worshiper, the teacher, the missionary evangelist, the teaching, the teaching, the doctrine, the doctrine. He said, pay attention to the doctrine, pay attention to the teaching, the saint, the sinner, the backslider. Uh, Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, but a good man shall be satisfied from himself. So the backslider is full of self. And the, and the opposite, the contrasting personality is someone satisfied from himself. He's self, one selfish, the other selfless. That sounds like that'll preach. The sick, the whole, the prayer, the powder, the doubter, the shouter, the soul winner. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Oh, what a verse. Till I come. Give attendance to reading. Please, please let me just, and, and someone the other night said, thank you for the challenge. Well, that's quite a compliment. Let me issue a challenge. I know that a lot of you have a Bible reading program and, and you're faithful to it. A lot of you don't. Since our faith is a direct result of our exposure to the Bible, I mean, it's essential. It's not some, something that's up for grabs, something that's optional. No, honey, it's not option, an option at all. Not if you're going to live for God. Not if you're going to have your prayers answered. Not if you're going to be informed. Please don't, don't hypocrite tonight. I wonder tonight how many would make a commitment. Like, like George Mueller. Oh, no, not every three months. But you'd say... If the Lord will keep me alive and in my right mind and give me eyes to see, I'm going to read my Bible. Amen. I mean, you can read like, do it any way you want. Read three chapters a day and four on Sunday. Now, if you read three a day and four on Sunday, you'll read through your Bible every year. And you don't have to get up and crow about it, but, but you'll know in your heart, you say, well, I've been saved seven years, and praise God, I've read my Bible through seven years. Now, Johnny McGill wanted to start that children's home in South Carolina for boys and girls about 10 years ago. He started reading his Bible through four times a year. And now they have about 60 acres, a million dollars worth of buildings, a boy's home and a girl's home. Johnny prayed it in, prayed the money in. Now, he's not Mueller, he's Johnny. Reading that Bible through four times. Dr. Don Green, you know him well. 147 times this year he's read his Bible through 147 times. Now, if I collapse tonight before I get out of here, Joanna called Dr. Green. She said, pray for Rufus. He, he collapsed, and won't you pray for Rufus? Well, so why would she call him? Because he's read his Bible through 147 times. That's the first read. Can't do that and not have faith. That takes hard work comes down to his study for morning and stays on his face nearly three hours going over his prayer list. Nearly three hours. 
if you prayed for me this morning. I just mentioned him. He prayed for me. Don't you want to really count? You don't want to be a hitchhiker, do you? Don't you want to really count and be high Valley Baptist Church? It's going to take faith. It's impossible to please him without it. I mean, it doesn't matter about your talents and your gifts. You just can't please Jehovah God without faith. And we're not going to have faith without this word. That's one of the reasons we have this Bible. You say, by the grace of God, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to read my Bible. Now, you might just want to start reading so many chapters now and then maybe January or after Christmas starting your program. But tonight I'm asking for those who make a commitment. Because you see, I know it'll change your life. Hey, mister, you start this tonight, you start reading three chapters a day and four on Sunday, you'll be a different husband. Your attitude will change. You'll have more wisdom to help your children. You'll know how to treat your wife. Hey, lady, you start reading that Bible, your husband will say, what has happened to you? I mean, it just puts everything in high gear. You'll be faithful and conscientious and compassionate and aware of the needs of others and there'll be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance in your personality and just from reading your Bible. You see, when you do that, you're giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. When you put that Word of God in there, you're giving Him something to work with. Keep you clean, keep you right, keep you straight. He'll keep you balanced. He calls you to want to be faithful. I wonder if there's anyone that would say, Preacher, by the grace of God, I know there's some things I can't do, but I can read my Bible. And by the grace of God, I'm going to make that commitment tonight. Vows are valuable. Oh, Preacher, the Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to make it and break it. But what's better than that is make it and keep it. And you know, I have found in my personal life, if I'm really sincere and I make a vow, he'll help me keep it. He, he'll say, eh, eh, you know what you said. And he'll help me keep my promise I made to him. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. He's on our side after all. I mean, he's really on our side. He's not some kind of a taskmaster, a slave driver. He's our precious Savior. And what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. He loves us. He really does. He'll help us keep our promise. I wonder without any saying or fanfare, would you just make your way down here and let's just get around here and pray. And then there's some here tonight that are far away from God. You know that you've drifted far away. You're saved as the Apostle Paul, but you know really you just kind of broken fellowship. Won't you come tonight and just tell Jesus that you're sorry? Just tell him you're sorry. Say, Jesus, I know that I've, I've gotten out of your will. And I just want to come tonight and tell you that I'm sorry. And oh, he'll just put his arms around you and pull you up real close. And then there may be someone lost. And you know if you were to die tonight, you'd fall into a frying hell. And you want to be saved. Won't you come? You don't have to confess anything to us. Just come and tell Jesus about it. Just come and say, Jesus, I'm lost. And I want to be saved tonight. And I want you to have mercy on me and forgive me of my sins. Best I know how I'm going to trust you and turn from self to the Savior. I'm going to trust you to save me tonight. Please have mercy on me and save me. Won't you come and ask him to save you? There are others that need to come. If you'd like to come tonight, no one's looking around. And perhaps there's something on your heart that hasn't even been addressed at all. God bless you. I see that hand. There's someone here that, that your need hasn't even been. Well, see, that doesn't matter. You're not doing business with us anyway. You're doing business with Jesus and with God. And you just you pray. Pray there where you are. Right where you are. Won't you do that, mister? Just humble yourself there before the Lord. Lady, precious lady that lifted your hand, just commit that thing to the Lord. Let's all pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we know that you're looking down upon us right now and you see more than just our, the posture of our body. You see the posture of our heart. We're humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. And we pray that you'd cleanse us and we pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, with yourself. And help us, Lord, as we commit our time, commit our mind, commit our life to you to read this precious liquid love, this precious holy Bible. And Lord, if you will give us 
eyesight, mental awareness. And I pray you'd remind us, remind us. And it'd be handy for some of us to listen to tapes and just read it from the page. Lord, we commit to thee this time and this awareness of the responsibility of having faith. And we promise you, we're going to read our Bibles through every year. And some can read more than that. We're going to read our Bibles. And we claim that promise you gave us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that you'll use this to increase our faith. And we know that that will intensify all of our Christian effort. This faith will just cause everything about our Christian life to be better and more effective in our witness, warmer and realer in our fellowship one with another, more effective in our teaching. We'd be better parents, better young people, a better example, just a better Christian all the way around because we're filling ourselves with the Word of God and you'll fill us build us up in our most holy faith. I pray that you'd forgive us of sin. Help us, Lord, to experience revival and go on our way rejoicing. Please save those that are lost and help these that lift their hands just a moment ago for prayer. You know their need. Please answer from heaven. Give us renewal and revival and rejoicing all for the glory of God. In Jesus' name. Write it down in your book. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.